gentlemen, welcome to Ombudsman 2019. I want to thank you all for braving the cold and the snow and making it here today. I greatly appreciate it. I'm sure some people were um, scared away by the rain and snow, but we're all here. Um, we've got a fantastic panel in front of us to do some discussions about types of ombuds and what ombudsing means to us and to you. Um, we have a couple of learning objectives that we're going to try to get across throughout this uh, next coming hour. Um, one of them is how to say ombudsman. <laughs> it's kind of a funny word, right? It's kind of a, a funny word. A lot of people in the uh, ombud space don't go by ombudsman, they just use the ombuds word. Ombudsman is not uh, any gender or anything like that, it's just the word, but uh, a lot of people have preferred to use the word ombuds. Is everybody kind of familiar with the term ombuds and the, and the phrasing and how it's pronounced and what they are? There was a survey that came out beforehand and it seems like most of you are fairly familiar with what an ombuds or an ombudsman does and what an ombuds office is able to provide. Um, if there are any questions, of course, you can always bring those up with the panel as we move forward. Um, there are three types of ombuds and I have a fun little video to share with you that kind of describes that. And these panels will represent those different types of ombuds and how they would approach these situations differently. So um, bear with me as I put this video on for you, for your viewing pleasure. Mm -hmm. Hi, welcome to Ombuds Day. If you're like most people, you probably don't even know what an ombuds is or does. Let's see if we can get some clarity. As a bird, I observe humans and the many conflicts. I've noticed that those who have an ombuds tend to have more success and control over their situations. Let's take a closer look at this important service for the unusual name. The word comes from the full Swedish word ombudsman, meaning we represent. Around the world, ombuds help individuals and organizations through conflict. There are three main types of ombuds, including organizational, classical, and advocate. Let's explore each one. Organizational ombuds manage internal grievances and conflicts within organizations. They coach people to better understand challenging situations and think through next steps in line with their goals. They also raise trends and emerging issues to the organizational leadership. Organizational ombuds maintain neutral neutrality and do not advocate. They are situated independently in the organization, separate from other functions. All of their activities are informal and off the record. They are bound to maintain the confidentiality of their visitors. Classical ombuds receive and investigate complaints against administrative bodies or governments. They ensure fair treatment for citizens, residents, and members of the public, and they provide recommendations or findings, but decisions are not binding. Classical ombuds consist with internal or external constituents. They also work independently to provide reports or summaries on the issues that come you may see them in prisons, news organizations, and state and local governments. Advocate ombuds are in the private and public sectors. They protect individual rights and service resources from those of power and balance. They objectively evaluate complainants' claims and represent people to initiate institutional action. You may see advocate ombuds in healthcare facilities, long-term care facilities, and some branches of their own forces. They usually help clients on a given facility or organization, not the internal employees. Regardless of the type of ombuds, their main function is to help people navigate conflicts with each other and their respective institutions. Please visit the tables representing different types of ombuds to learn more and to see if any one of the institutions you engage with offer the service to you. It might just help you feel free as a, well, as we. Fantastic, I love that video. Okay, before we dive in, please allow me to introduce the panel to you. Um, our first panelist is Mary Chavez Rudolph. She's an organizational ombuds. She is representing the federal sector. She's from the Department of Interior. She, uh, I did not get the number of years that you've been working there. Can you tell me that? Almost three. She's been there for almost three years. And a fun fact about Mary is that she's an avid cyclist. She enjoys cycling with her, with her family and her husband in particular. So please welcome Mary. Um, our next panelist is Linda Kokenauer. 
She's a consumer ombuds. She is external facing. Uh, she has been an ombuds there for how many years? 33. 33 years. It's my favorite number. Um, a fun fact about Linda is she's an avid skier. She has been to 75 different ski resorts. Even though she's in Arizona, mind you. Her son goes to see you. That's probably why we're blessed with her presence here today. And she encouraged him to come here so that she could do some more skiing. Yay! All right, fantastic. Our next panelist is Jerry Hauser. Jerry's on his home turf. He's from the University of Colorado. He's an organizational ombuds representing the academic sector. He's both internal and external facing. Uh, Jerry, how long? How many years have you been here? At the university or as an ombuds? As an ombuds. We'll just go that. Uh, I'm f six years. Six years. Okay, six years. And a fun fact about Jerry is he walked across Niagara Falls oh. and is here to tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Our next panelist is Stephanie Villa Fuerte. She's an advocate ombuds from the private sector. She is external facing. She has been an ombuds in this position for about four years. And a fun fact about Stephanie is she is a triathlete. Well, that fits right in here in Boulder, right? You're fantastic, really great. And our last, but certainly not our least, panelist is Casey Wallace. Casey is a hybrid ombuds. She is an athlete ombuds, which would make sense since she works at the United States Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. Um, there's a lot of people there that she serves. Uh, she's external facing. She's been in that role for five years. Uh, a fun fact about Casey is that she has spent some time traveling on the past few months. She was in Peru with the Pan American Games and the Pan American Para... Parapan. Parapan, thank you. And then she had to go to Poland to do some anti-doping relationships with the Polish Olympic Committee and uh, are discussing opening up an office or an, uh, having an ombuds office there. I, I'm sure I they're ruined that entire at, thing. They're looking at an anti-doping ombudsman for the World Anti-Doping Organization. <laughs> yeah, very interesting stuff. So, thank you so much. So that's our panel. Please give them a big hand. Thank you. And we're going to start off by asking a couple questions of the panelists, and you're going to be able to get different perspectives depending upon what roles they play. And so even though it's the same question, these ombuds might have a different uh, answer or different comments to add to that. So the first question that we'll be bringing to the panel is, what are the reasons an organization, government entity, association, et cetera, would want an ombuds program? Why do you want an ombuds program, right? What's the benefits? Um, Mary, I'm going to ask you to start that off, please. Okay. Well, so um, I, I guess I would point to the cost of conflict. Um, you know, all the costs in terms of, you know, starting out with loss of productivity in an organization. Um, we, you hear about uh, people getting fed up with things. They start filing grievances and complaints, and so you're involving a lot more people, management, EEO, HR professionals. Um, it can get to the point where people get fed up and they leave the organization. So when you think about the amount of money that goes into recruiting people and keeping them on board, training them, and they walk out the door because they've just had it. And a lot of times it's the good employees, the ones who can really go out there and get another job, who leave. And so you um, you know you think about the turnover and the, the cost to the organization for that. Uh, all the way up to um, you know a loss of reputation for an organization. So lots of costs. Um, not to even mention the the kind of the human costs. You know the emotional and physical costs of stress and things like that. People calling in sick because they just can't uh, get up in the morning and go to work. So I think that's definitely uh, a, a big reason why organizations have ombudsmen. Hopefully ombudsmen can help mitigate those costs by. Um, helping people to resolve issues at a lower level, and um, and again, it, hopefully, it, it helps people in general, not just the cost to the organization. Great, thank you very much, Mary. Um, now, our, our second perspective on this question: What are the reasons, that, as an organization, government would have an ombuds program? I'd like to ask Linda to please chime in. Thank you. Um, can you hear us all right back there? Can you hear us? Okay. Thank you. So I work for Salt River Project. It's a power and um, water utility in Phoenix, Arizona. We have over six million mm -hmm. customers. And we have six basic reasons why we have an ombudsman office. And one is, and this will be unique for, I think we're the only one here that has this reason, is 
this utility is not regulated by a public service commission as investor owned utilities are. And so our customers had no place to appeal disputes to if they had an issue with the company. So our ombudsman office was established 33 years ago to be that place where people could be heard. And having a place to be heard builds customer satisfaction with our customers and therefore we have fewer complaints in the community and there, therefore there's also less pressure to be regulated, to have legislation or some other regulatory agency uh, oversee us. So the company really likes that we have this ombudsman office because we can handle things independently and get things resolved quickly. Another reason would be to save legal costs. If uh, customers are dissatisfied, they might tend to take their issues uh, legally, and that's a high cost to the company, high cost to the customer too. It also is delays the process of getting the dispute resolved, so we try to keep the cases out of litigation. And I know in 33 years, I've only had 12 cases that have gone to litigate after the Ombudsman Office worked through them and investigated them. So we're pleased about that. Also, adverse media coverage. We prefer not to have our reputation of the company tarnished out in the community, so we like to resolve things internally. Um, we are a single point of contact. If customers do get to our office, we handle whatever their issues are holistically so they don't have to go from one department to another and be referred, which improves operating efficiencies and customer satisfaction. Um, Customers just generally like to be heard by somebody independent, not in the operations area where the policies and procedures preside. And so they kind of like to ask, have their questions answered by someone that's neutral and find out what options they have to rectify whatever their issue they are having with the company. Um, and lastly, I might mention that we are a catalyst for change in, that, in the organization. We find out systemic problems that um, our customers are having with different processes or programs or services and then we are forced to advocate for the changes in those policies to improve customer satisfaction. So those are several reasons why our company has this ombudsman office. Fantastic. Thank you, Linda. Um, after our third panelist, we probably will have some time for one or two brief questions. So uh, if you have a question, maybe you can wait till the end of the panel. Um, our last, our third betting cleanup on this question will be Stephanie. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm Stephanie, and um, I serve as Colorado's uh, Child Protection Ombudsman. Uh, our office was uh, established in law in 2010. And I would say that the main reason that we were established was really to bring transparency and accountability to child protective services. Uh, our office was really born out of a series of tragedies in 2007. Uh, namely, we had 12, 12 uh, children who died in child protective custody. Uh, meaning that we removed them from parents we deemed were too unsafe to take care of them, only to have them die uh, within our care. And so if you can imagine, um, there was a huge public outcry. Um, there were a number of <laughs> legislative hearings where the public really were frustrated. Um, many people said they had tried to report child abuse and never could find the right door to do so. Others said they had concerns about child safety and couldn't get a response back from various agencies. And so we were really born in response um, um, to making that system more transparent and more effective um, and to bring confidence to a really important government service, uh, namely Child Protective Services. So um, I would say in a nutshell um, that those were the reasons that we were born and that's really the purpose that we serve today. Well, thank you, Stephanie. So some very different responses here to, you know, what, what are the reasons an organization should have an ombuds office or an ombudsman in, in, in the organization? Um, are there any questions? We have probably time for one brief question if we have one. If we don't, we will move right on to the second question. Not all at once, please. All right. um, <laughs> we'll move on to our second question now. Uh, the second question is, is kind of a fun one. Not that the first one wasn't fun. Um, what are the biggest challenges you face in your ombuds role? And we know as ombuds that there are a lot of challenges in this space. And so, um, from here, I'm going to start off with Jerry, please. Oh, boy. Well, uh, the challenges, uh, the biggest challenges are um, helping individuals come to clarity on what's, uh, uh, what has them in a state of commotion. When folks come to talk to us, they are usually uh, agitated. And so uh, one of our challenges is always to 
uh, to help that person uh, reach a point where we can uh, start to dissect what they've said into what seem to be the fundamental issues um, that they're facing because in their, in their emotional state, usually there are several issues and they've all been jumbled together and they're, they know that they're upset and they know that they don't have control over their situation and so helping them come to clarity helps them to think about it. Um, another challenge that we face is um, the challenge of how to move forward when there is an exceptional power differential between the person who's come to see us and the person that they're in an antagonistic relationship with. Um, and the challenges there are um, what they can do or what they feel safe doing, what they will allow us to do or feel safe allowing us to do, and uh, whether we can find uh, something other than um, the catharsis of the moment because if we can't find a way forward, if we can't help them find a way forward, then they are pretty much going to be returning to us or remain in, in a state of um, peril. So, so those would be two of the big challenges that I think I face on a regular basis. Thank you, Jerry, that's uh, really insightful. Uh, I'd like to ask that same question. What are the biggest challenges you face in your ombuds role to Casey? Thank you. I think two of the, two of the biggest challenges we have faced, um, particularly these last two years, is around clarity of role, the role of our office and the scope of our office. Um, the U.S. Olympic Committee is an, an amateur athletics is governed by a federal statute in our country. That federal statute was, um, was a 1978 act called the Ted Stevens Act. In 1998, because of a lot of problems with athletes, there were some provisions added that said, athletes need more rights and we need a more effective way to resolve disputes. So in those 98 um, amendments, they added an athlete ombudsman position. The way it's articulated in the act is that we are there to give independent advice to athletes regarding all the rules and issues that, that they're under, as well as to help mediate disputes. And I think with the, Na the Larry Nasser issue that came to light 2016, 2017, and, and continues um, today, was a really broad look within the Olympic and Paralympic movement around athlete rights, athlete voice, and athlete support. And our office became, you know, a lot of eyes were looking at our office with respect to how we support athletes in trouble. And do they know where to go? Do they know where to get confidential advice? And what became clear in this look, this scrutiny, was the people who brought this, um, these amendments into the act believe that they brought in the ombudsman role as an advocacy role, probably much like yours. Um, whereas the act is articulated as more of a neutral facilitator role and independent advisor. And those two don't necessarily work together. Um, when you think about athlete rights and athlete issues, um, a lot of the Olympic and Paralympic movement is based on scarcity. There's winners and losers off, on and off the field of play. There's money, there's investment, um, there's team spots all along the way. And so to be an advocate, you often have to choose one athlete, one individual, or one position. And we were structured to be more of a neutral office. So there's been a lot of push and pull these last two years um, with the athlete community, within Congress, within those who were the victim community, the families, looking at us saying, are you advocates or are you facilitators and mediators? Are you dispute resolution mechanism? And we have been fighting to be more of this dispute resolution mechanism available to all athletes regardless of their situation. So supporting accused and victims in a safe sport context um, clean athletes or athletes who may find themselves accused of a doping allegation. Um, so we are fighting for this neutral position. Um, 
I think that's been one of the biggest challenges as well as scope. We serve 50 sports athletes at every level of every sport. Stephanie probably doesn't know that when she does a triathlon, if she wins a prize and she gets tested by the anti-doping agency and she gets a letter, our contact information is on her letter. So we deal with um, the young. There's been no letter, just. <laughs> there's been no letter. But um, whether you're talking about safe sport, anti-doping, team selection, money, commercial rights, sponsor issues, our office is the reciprocal. Re our office deals with all of those issues. So the scope um, of our office, we are also trying to narrow so that we can really focus on the elite athlete population and what the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee stands for. Great, thank you, Casey. And for our third perspective on what are the biggest challenges you face in your ombuds role, we'll go to Mary, please. Okay. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, I think, a challenge that I've had. So um, prior to working with the Department of Interior, I worked at the University of Colorado. I was an ombuds with the University of Colorado Denver Health Science Center and uh, in, uh, here in Boulder for about 13 years. And, and I think I felt it at both organizations at times, and that is kind of um, a sense of powerlessness a, as an ombuds. And let me tell you about that. In the, in the video, you saw that the four standards that an ombuds adheres to, confidentiality, neutrality, informality, and independence, um, the positive side of that informality and that independence is that we can be confidential, which is really, really important to the role. People need to feel like they can come to you, talk through an issue, and not feel like you're, especially in the workplace, go to their supervisor, end up in their personnel file, or, or something like that. The downside of that informality and independence is you have no authority. You can't make anyone do anything. You don't have the ability to... Um, more directly address a situation. And so you can imagine sometimes as an ombuds you might hear multiple complaints about a particular person or a, about a particular issue and you would like to be able to address it, you know, again more directly. So sometimes, um, you know, we'll, we'll go to, uh, again if we hear of enough complaints where it's starting to become what we call a trend, a pattern of, of a behavior that we feel that really does need to be addressed, we can go to upline management and, and talk through it. And it, and it can be um, it can be difficult when they're just not really willing to, to hear it. You know, oftentimes it's an employee. Um, we know how communication happens in organizations. It's often um, kind of top down in, in that, you know, the upline manager is talking to the supervisor all the time and hearing about these employees who are, are not uh, doing very well or, you know, having problems, not, not following through on things. So again, given the way communication happens in organizations, oftentimes upline management doesn't really see the same things that we might see as an ombuds or hear the same kinds of things. And, and again, as an ombuds, you always know that there are different perspectives, and there's probably at least a couple perspectives, probably you know more than that, at least three. So we, we take that into account, but once you start hearing from multiple people that there's, there's an issue, um, and again, it, it can be kind of difficult because you'd like to sometimes be able to address it more, more directly. Um, one of the things that I've learned, and, and, and uh, even when I started at the Department of Interior, someone told me that, you know, it, in really trying to have impact, it's about developing relationships. You know, you really have to work to make sure that people understand you're there, whether it be employees or management, kind of the, the issue that you were talking about, Casey, in terms of making sure that people understand that you're, you're not an advocate for employees, you're not an advocate for, for managers, making sure they understand that you're a neutral party. Um, and that you're you're there, which can be a real challenge where where I work because I work with uh, two bureaus in particular, the Bureau of Land Management and the Bureau of Reclamation. So we're talking about ten states, you know, so ten ten states, five regions that I'm dealing with. So developing relationships with you know possibly twelve, well, more like fifteen HR offices, EEO offices. Uh, management in all those states. So it can be a real challenge to just 
kind of you know spread your spread yourself across all these organizations and develop those relationships so that when you do call to say that there's some kind of a problem that they're willing to to look at it and and again we're not you know as an ombuds you say you know I'm not an investigator I didn't investigate this um, you know these are, are perceptions these are these are this is what I'm hearing um, but it might be a time for you to look into something and then we're a consultant with them at that point to talk through what are their options for for getting more information and finding out if there's a problem here and then addressing it and that's often what we do ter too in terms of how do you address the situation because there's often if there's been a trend like that there's a lot of employees who are frustrated and and uh, again talking about those costs of conflict thinking about leaving and, and moving on to a place that's more positive so those are a couple of the obstacles that, that we deal with um, in the Department of Interior fantastic thank you Mary here comes the fun part. <laughs> Other stuff was fun too, I know. Uh, we have some scenarios here that are kind of typical of an ombuds or an ombuds situation might uh, uh, encounter. And so we have some situations, some scenarios inside this basket. I'm going to ask people to pull these out one at a time and we'll go from that point on. And one of our panelists will address the scenario. Hi, right, Lois, will you please select that point for us? <laughs> Do I get to read it? Please. Bigger. <laughs> Mary Chavez Rudolph. Oh, okay. Federal uh -oh. Ombuds, organizational ombuds, workplace conflict. Okay. All right. So, yeah, you can imagine all of the different kinds of conflicts that c people can have in the organization, whether it's around performance evaluation time or, uh, you know, lots of peer kinds of coworker conflict that comes up. Um, someone comes to you and says, you know, I don't seem to communicate well with this person. We've had lots of conflict. What do I do about it? You know, ideally they're coming to us at a lower level before they've filed any kind of a grievance or gone to the upline supervisor. But, you know, part of it is talking through what, what's occurred, uh, what have you tried, what doesn't, what hasn't worked, what's worked, um, and talking through what are your options, what are your resources. One of the big resources that we refer people a lot to is the employee assistance program. Um, as you can imagine, you know, when people are having conflict at work, it's very important to them, you know, it's what feeds their families and, you know, they're worried that if they, you know, get into trouble or whether they're having conflict with the coworker or with their supervisor, that it could mean the loss of, of you know, their, their, um, their way of making a living. So uh, it's, there's a lot of stress involved and one of the resources we often refer people to is employee assistance, someone to go to and talk through the, the stress that they're feeling um, to make sure that they don't get to a point where, you know, I mean, I've had people come to me and say they, um, they're drinking too much, they're eating too much, they've lost, uh, you know, this has cost, cost them their marriage, because you get obsessed. It's like when you're, you know, on, it, it's the same as uh, being out there on the, on the school, in the schoolyard when you feel like you're being bullied and you have no resources and you feel like um, you, you get obsessed with it. What am I going to do next time this person comes up to me? What should I have said? And so you're just constantly talking about it to your, to your um, you know, the important people in your life and they get kind of tired of that and you end up uh, with a loss of relationships. So um, talking through that with people, um, individuals, um, and talking about options. What are the different things that you can do to help management, whether uh, help manage the conflict, mediation, uh, you know, and then we do talk about formal things, filing grievances, um, you know, going to an upline manager. So there's lots of different things that we talk through. Avoiding the, the conflict sometimes. Maybe that means finding a different uh, position or in the government you can do something called, you can get a detail and get away from the situation for three or four months and do something different. So, um, so talking through options. Sometimes it's a manager who is the one who gives us a call, a supervisor. Uh, sometimes it's an HR person who says, you know, we just went through an investigation here or a climate assessment and we want to know what do we do now? 
maybe there were some findings of inappropriate behavior, maybe there weren't any findings, and we have to figure out what are some things that we can do to get everyone working together again productively. So it's talking through, you know, is it mediation? If it's a couple people, is it a group facilitation? Is it a leadership issue? You know, is there kind of inappropriate behavior or just not anything inappropriate, but just not good leadership, not good management? So talking through what kind of training, maybe a 360 and doing some coaching for the supervisor. Maybe it's training for the whole office. So um, working through what are the options that that manager has to try to get everyone working together again. Um, what's nice is that, again, I told you I work with, you know, like 15 different offices throughout, you know, about 10 states. So luckily, um, sometimes it's me. Um, doing some direct services, doing a training or something like that, but other times it's getting a contractor. We have contractors um, throughout the, the United States who we can uh, get uh, doing any of that work that I just told you about. Mediation, facilitation, training, 360s, coaching, uh, maybe some kind of a team building. So it's, it's, it's been a fun, fun to kind of be an ombuds and work with all of these people to, to help get that department back on, on their feet. Great. Thank you, Mary. Um, we have maybe a moment for if there's a question for Mary uh, on a workplace conflict or uh, on that process. We could take that at this moment. If not, we'll go back to the basket. <laughs> okay. Back to the basket. Taylor, please. Uh, this is for Linda, the executive public sector ombudsman. Uh, it is palm tree topped and very much frond upon. Thank you, Taylor. I love that time. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> All right, Linda? So there's something we had written. We're not going to read that to get, set the stage. Would you like me to read that? Yeah, it's, 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 um, it's, it's your choice on how you want okay. to either um, deliver that or... Well, I, I can just deliver it without okay. reading it. Okay, so here's set the stage is we get a call one day from a very, very irate uh, gentleman. He had come home to find a palm tree in his backyard chopped off at the top, so all the fronds were gone. So you had, in essence, a big stalk. And um, he obviously was not happy, nor was his wife, who happened to have come home at the time that the crews were out uh, chopping off the top of the tree. Well, to set the stage on that, right now, as you know, in California, 700,000 customers are out of power for PG&E because of trees and power lines. That's why all utilities, um, power utilities, need to keep the trees out of the power lines. Well, this palm tree was in the power line, and that's the reason the company went out and chopped the tree. Unfortunately, um, the customer stated that they had had no notification that there was even a problem, that all of a sudden, to their knowledge, we just showed up and uh, lopped off the top of their beautiful tree by their pool. Um, so they wanted compensation. They wanted to have the situation rectified immediately because the next week they were having a wedding shower because they were getting married shortly. Uh, so now we have this backyard that's going to have the wedding shower and has this beautiful stalk. <laughs> stalk. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we got that call. Uh, it kind of surfaced around the vegetation management or line clearing group, and they didn't know quite what to do with it. They had the right to go and cut the tree, but they should have notified them um, ahead of time and see if there was any options available, because sometimes there are some options. With palm trees, though, you can't trim it very well. You really, if it's in the lines, you really have no choice but to uh, kill the, the palm, in essence, by cutting the top of it. <laughs> So what we did, first of all, is we worked really quickly to make sure that the crew could get out and cut the tree down to ground level, at least, so that the next week when the party was happening, there at least would not be this un, uh, unappealing stalk. Um, <laughs> then we went and investigated, and we thought, well, really, did we always give notification. Why did this uh, couple not have get any notification? We checked with the records and found out that a door hanger had been hung on the house door, front door, a couple months previously. A phone call was made by the vegetation management foresters to tell them the tree was in the lines and with no response. They had just left a message. 
And then a couple months went by and then they stuck another door hanger on the house. And when they had no contact, because the door hanger said, please call us immediately, your trees and the lines were concerned for your safety. It's a very hazardous situation. When they did not hear from anyone, they knew that they needed to get this tree out of, out of the way before the monsoon season hit. Because when the trees sway, that's when they're gonna catch on fire with the power line. And so they had a bucket truck that could go over the backyard uh, from a alleyway, and they went out and proceeded then to chop the top of the tree off. They thought they were in a good position because they had given notice, they thought. <coughs> well, the reality was my ombudsman investigated the situation, and the notification two months previously with the phone call and the door hanger was given to the prior owner. This couple had just moved in. <laughs> and had not been there at the time the notification was being you know tried and they did not see the door hanger apparently even the more recent try um, they never go in and out of the, the front door apparently and which is a problem i don't think that's the best way to notify people but we had no information as to their emails or phone number because they were a new customer so we did not know that the house had turned over so long story short, we also went out to the site to see if the tree was really that close to the lines because there have been times where uh, customers might argue that the tree was cut down or trimmed and it wasn't even close to the lines. You have to have a 10 foot clearance um, to keep it safe from um, hazards like the fire. Uh, and so we did go out to check it out because one of the fieldmen who was on site at the time the tree was being cut also stated that he was just doing his job. He really didn't think the tree needed to be cut down. And he mentioned that to the couple who were so unhappy. So on top of this, they're like, why did you cut it down? You didn't give notification. And one of your own people said it didn't really need to be cut down. So the ombudsman in our office does a lot of investigation and just goes out, you know, look, taking a look at it from the customer side and SRP side to see what uh, is the right thing to do to try to rectify some of these problems so that we don't have legal matters go to the media and things of that nature. Um, I think that, let's see, there was a site visit. They also checked the recording. The woman, by the way, had taken a, a recording of the conversation with that field man. And indeed he did say, I don't think the tree really needed to come out. Mm -hmm. So we, as a company, mm -hmm. uh, had erred in many ways. And when that information from my ombudsman was presented to the director of the vegetation management group, with that, all those facts, they felt very badly that this had transpired without the notification. So with the couple wanting some compensation for all their hardship and and so forth there was a small check that was ended up being um, drafted for the couple so that they could buy some new vegetation fill in that void and so on and so forth um, they felt that they were heard by coming to the ombudsman office uh, we spearheaded the investigation and the communications with them for over three weeks to come to some kind of an equitable resolution and now we have a very satisfied customer despite they have no palm tree in their backyard that's great so we deal with interesting issues that's great that's a great issue all right, that's a, that's, that's a fun story. We'll enjoy it, though. <laughs> Thank you. Unless um, it was your palm tree. Right? Yeah. yeah. That's not such a fun story. Anyway, right. exactly. Thank you so much for that one, Linda. Thank All right, you. back to the yeah, basket exactly. again. I'm going to go on over this side. I don't want to ignore little this part of the room. Mm -hmm. Would you please stay cool? Sure. Before I start, I just want to introduce Christine Jennings, who is the program coordinator in our office. And she was an open water swimmer. Mm. Our third colleague, uh, Emily Azevedo, is, was an Olympic uh, bobsledder. And she's finishing her last semester in law school. Um, but I, th you know, I think in our office, in addition to giving that independent advice and helping to problem solve, I mean, I think much of our role is walking alongside athletes through this journey. There's a lot of ups and downs, and you know, I, we're committed to making sure athletes know they're valued and, and they're cared about aside from medals and money. So the, the scenario that I um, want to share is, is an athlete who I have had a relationship with recently 
she had a concussion last year. She's actually a Paralympic medalist. She had a concussion. She's had a neck injury. She's trying to work her way back in right now and trying to navigate this return from injury. And she wrote an email to me a month or so ago forwarding an email that she had gotten from her coach which said, to recap our conversation from yesterday, your athlete stipend, which is really the income that athletes count on, um, for the month of August is being withheld for the following reasons. You've um, failed to complete and provide any detailed training notes for, um, with the strength and conditioning staff, lack of communication in general, failure to communicate with the sports psych, um, And be sure to follow the instructions closely, um, and we'll get back to you and let you know if you'll get your money next month. And she wrote to me and said, you know, the only thing that's true in that email is I didn't talk to the sports psych because I'm afraid the sports psych is sharing my information with the coaches, and I want to have a candid conversation. I never knew that I wouldn't get my money for not communicating well. Um, and in fact, I have been emailing and asking for a program, asking for a strength and conditioning program, and haven't heard back from the coach. So um, she and I were working through this. Over the weekend, she texted me and said, I'm having panic attacks. I'm ready to quit. I just need to get on with my life. And so this is a lot of what we deal with. I, I think there's. There's financial issues, there's mental health issues, there's return from uh, injury issues, there's confidentiality issues, there's fear of retaliation issues. She's fearful that if she continues to pursue this, that she won't be selected for the team. And the selection is quite subjective, so it's, it's a real fear. So I think what, what we've tried to do is work with her to, to build up her base of support and at the same time address the problems. And, and right now, she's, we've gotten her um, stipend reinstituted. We have talked to her, the supervisor, the coach, because at the same time, we've gotten a call from an athlete on the same team who was pregnant and said, I'm fearful to tell my coach because I might not get selected to the team. Mm -hmm. And another athlete who has a lifetime disabling disease and was also injured and said, I don't know what to do because I'm losing my health insurance and I'm losing my direct athlete support and the coach is not giving me good information. So I think there were some also some issues with the coach here. And one of the roles that our office plays is the ability to see trends. And we went to this coach's supervisor and the coach is actually now being held on a performance plan to look at how he's communicating and supporting his athletes. And we're continuing to walk this journey. It's not done yet, um, but just trying to help this athlete figure out how to navigate this big picture, which really is her identity in her life. Um, she trains full time, and that's how she makes her money. Well, fantastic story, very complex situation. Yeah, it's a, lot, a lot to work through there. Um, OK, great. We still have a couple more. Let's see here, let's go back here, have some fun in the back row, please. Stephanie, advocate on the neglect of children. Yes, uh, so, aha, uh -huh, da da. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a great introduction, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, our office handles um, approximately 600 calls annually. Uh, we hear from grandparents um, who are concerned about their grandchildren. We hear from respondent parents who want to understand um, why their children were taken from their care, uh, when they can uh, get their children back into their care. Uh, we receive calls from mandated reporters um, who are concerned that when they've made a specific report that the responding agency, typically a human service agency, hasn't gone out to visit children. Um, you know, 
I would tell you probably 85 to 90 percent of the calls that we receive, uh, we are able to resolve um, through facilitation, through communication. Uh, as you can all imagine, child protection is a very complicated business. Uh, we have our own language, our own rules, our own regulations, and really, um, most lawyers don't understand them, let alone lay people. So there really is a lot of room for communication. And, and I have a great staff. I'd love you to wave your hands. Yes. Hey. Uh, these are the folks who take these calls. And, and they're emotional calls. Um, as you can well imagine, people have lost their children or they're concerned that a child is in harm's way. Um, so you know, an example of what I would call more of an emergent uh, concern uh, happened probably about a year and a half ago. We had uh, a family therapist. Um, um, who is a mandated reporter, uh, go into a family's home and provide services. Uh, initially, when she went into the home, uh, services had been placed there because it was deemed that it was still safe for the children to be there as long as they could be supported by outside services. Um, that arrangement went all right for a little bit until one day the family therapist came in and she was looking around. She was very concerned about the condition of the home. She also had received information from a neighbor uh, nearby who had said that the parents in the house had um, had very large parties. There was methamphetamine use, um, drug and alcohol use. Uh, and during these parties, um, they would place their two-year-old child in a dog crate. Mm -hmm. So that the child couldn't get harmed, um, presumably while they were having their parties. Mm -hmm. The other thing that a neighbor told the therapist is that they had a 12-year-old daughter um, that they would give alcohol to during the parties because they thought it was funny to see her drunk um, because she couldn't handle her liquor. Uh, and so the family therapist heard about this. She called the local human service agency as a mandated reporter and said, hey, I have concerns about this two and this 12-year-old. Well, the agency um, refused to go out. They refused to go out and do what we call an assessment. In other words, to even lay eyes on the children or the family. Um, in their words, um, they said that they actually thought it was protective of the family to put a child in the dog crate. Um, that that way the child can get hurt, right? And they could keep an eye on the child. They didn't have to worry about the child running around. The other thing that the human service agency had indicated was that um, there was no evidence. It was just hearsay that the 12-year-old had been made to have liquor. So the mandated reporter called us, and, and she's concerned. She just left a home where she's had um, these allegations um, about a 2- and a 12-year-old, uh, and that they're being exposed to some pretty unsafe conditions, and nobody is listening to her. Uh, so she called our office. Um, and what we were able to do, because of the relationships um, that Mary has referenced previously, is we were able to call the local human service agency where the initial call had been made. Um, unfortunately, they told us the same thing. They're like, the two-year-old is safe. That is protective behavior. Uh, and the 12-year-old, you know, we don't really have any evidence that the child was made to, to engage in any sort of um, drinking. So, um, you know, this all happened probably about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I remember it was on a Friday. And um, we're like, well, what do we do, right? It's 2 o'clock. It's Friday. We have to do something. Um, these are not the sort of conditions where a 2- and a 12-year-old should be left unattended. Um, and so in that instance, uh, we were able to call the State Department of Human Services, the supervising entity for the counties. Um, that's how we operate here in, in Colorado. And we were able to explain these concerns, um, and more importantly, that this was a time constraint, um, that we were really worried that this is an emergency concern. And while we are also mandated reporters within our office, clearly our report wasn't going to go any further than the therapist report had gone. Um, they just simply didn't see that this was an emergency of any sorts. Um, fortunately, because of the relationships we have with the State Department, um, they immediately agreed that at a minimum that somebody had to go out and assess the children that day um, in order to make sure there weren't um, safety concerns or if there were um, to take action before the weekend came. And, and then that's what they did. Um, ultimately, we learned that um, once they got out there and with the state's intervention, that indeed there were additional concerns. Um, they found drugs that were within the children's reach that were in the wide open on tables and on countertops. Uh, and eventually, 
um, they ended up opening a case on that particular family uh, and getting the children to at least temporary emergency shelter. Uh, so, you know, that's an example of, of what we sort of call an emergency um, within our office. Um, the vast majority of our cases, I would say, do not usually rise to that level. Um, you know, I, I see in probably 90% of the cases that we handle um, that there really are more communication concerns, um, you know, language concerns. People are speaking different language. They're not understanding um, requirements of a treatment plan. Um, they're not understanding what court orders are in effect. Um, but um, that would probably be a situation where I think that our office can be most effective. Um, it kind of goes back to how I started this conversation um, back in 2007. Right? Citizens were concerned that when they made a call, they could not get the assistance they needed. And indeed, there was a real life and, you know, death threat to a child. Um, and so, you know, there's moments like this where you realize, like, the power of this office to be able to step in and act um, in an immediate situation like that is really important. Um, so. Thank you, Stephanie. Yep. That's fantastic. Okay, we have one scenario left. Who can guess who's going to talk about that one? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Rich. Rich, please. Okay, for Jerry Hauser, um, <laughs> University Faculty Ombuds Postdoc Problems. Okay, you've heard about uh, situations where there were um, sensational outcomes. I'm going to take you down to the mundane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You all know what a postdoc is, right? Okay, great. So I'm a faculty ombuds at CU, and what that means in the context of CU is two things. First, it means that I'm a retiree, and I'm hired back as a part-timer to, to uh, see faculty members or graduate students or postdocs, so people at that, that level who may be having difficulties. And I get visited frequently by postdocs. And so a postdoc comes to visit me. It's in the fall and she says um, that she came to, uh, to see you on a grant with co-PIs. They're in two different departments and they're trying to integrate their, their grant is one that's going to integrate their research, which work at different dimensions of this problem. And um, she's hired to bring the integration about. Uh, she, by training, uh, disciplinary training, is more aligned with one of the co-PIs than the other and had known of him in, in the uh, professionally. So her problems are twofold. The first problem is that the co-PIs have different research styles and different communication styles. And because of this, and because they're coming at the problem from different disciplinary perspectives, it's unclear what their shared expectations are. Um, and for the first two months, she's been getting mixed signals, uh, sometimes conflicting signals. She's been getting mixed and sometimes conflicting feedback. She's not sure what to do about this. She's concerned if this doesn't get straightened out, she may lose her position. So she needs to define her, she needs a clearer definition of her role. The second problem is the lab manager, who is proving to be problematic. Um, the lab manager, she says, is knowledgeable and she appears to be sociable, but First of all, she becomes abrasive at the least provocation. She's wa watched her turn on undergraduate students for the way they're conducting their experiments. She's seen them turn on graduate students. And she's even turned on her, for example, uh, an undergraduate student was a asked a question about how to conduct a particular experiment, what was the procedure involved, and she was providing the student with information so the student could be about it. And her business and the lab manager heard this and she pulled her aside and proceeded, actually she didn't pull her aside right in front of the student, she proceeded to uh, chew her out for 
uh, for answering the student's question. You should have referred her to me. That's not your position to do that, so on and so forth. And secondly, the lab manager tends to be territorial. She's not cooperative in sharing information that she says, I need to do my research. She seems suspicious of my need to know. Perhaps she's concerned that I'm, you know, trying to undermine her in some way. And so this is all creating a hostile work environment and making it difficult for her to do her work, impeding her scientific research. Um, to complicate matters, the lab manager has been in her position for a number of years and is co closely aligned with the co-PI who is not the one that the postdoc is aligned with disciplinarily. What should I do? So the first thing we do was, was to try to s separate the issues involved. They're the co-PI issues on the one hand and the lab manager issues on the other. And in this particular case, uh, that was fairly easy and she was pr pretty clear in her own mind that, they're, that, they're, that those were they're separated. So a large part of our time was spent uh, talking about how she might approach the co-PIs. Did it make sense, for example, to go to the PI that she was more closely aligned with and to explain the problem and to get a sense from him how to proceed? Did it make more sense to uh, ask the two of them if to call a meeting with the two of them and it would be her meeting because she was calling it? and to talk about the nature of the research project and try to get a sense of shared expectations so she could move forward. And so she kind of came to the idea that maybe a, a meeting with the co-PIs might be a good way to go and that they might try to get them to talk through what their shared expectations were and give her a clearer sense of role definition. What to do with the lab manager? Well, you could go to uh, you're the co-PI you're most aligned with and maybe, you know, talk about the problem with that person. Or you could go to the other co-PI and maybe talk to that person. Or maybe you could have in this meeting with the two co-PIs talk through this other issue that you're having. And she was a little bit averse about embracing that as a good solution. She was afraid that that might escalate the problem. So then we move to another alter set of alternatives. Well, let's try uh, 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 making yourself, an, uh, making her an ally. Uh, have you tried uh, reaching out to her socially? For example, go to lunch with her, have coffee with her, or bake cookies over the weekend and bring some cookies in. Mm -hmm. Chocolate chip cookies are everybody's favorite, though. <laughs> <laughs> they cover a multitude of sins. So we talked through a, a, a bunch of those scenarios. And she left with a sense that she was going to reach out to the two co-PIs and have a meeting. And she was going to try to build closer social bonds with the lab manager, try to be more observant of role definition as she was interpreting it and hoped that that would work out. And she left. And then eight months later, I got another phone call. <laughs> or the office got a phone call, and I was supposed to see this person. And Jerry, she says she's seen you before. Honestly, I don't remember. All of the records get shredded, and there's so many names that I can't recall them. And so uh, she walks in, and the I see her and I recognize her instantly. How's it going? Well, it's not going so well. Well, what do you mean? She said, well, the ambiguity's persisted. So how did you address that? Well, I think the way to address that is to change my reporting line, which she did. And that solved the first problem. She got, she worked between the two so that the grant could be structured so that she would work with the, the, the one co-PI who she was most closely aligned with and whose communication style 
mesh with hers. As for the lab manager, she really hadn't figured out any, um, any way of dealing with it. And where matters were left were either she was going to talk to her, she was ready now to have her supervisor talk with the lab manager to rein her in, or um, she felt there was a good chance if that didn't happen and it continued, she would leave the university. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. So that's a real, th that situation is fairly typical in terms of uh, we don't know how it, how it turns out. We don't always get people coming back, occasionally we do. Uh, in terms of the ambiguities and uh, sense of vulnerability in terms of going forward to address the issue and how to do that with, uh, and at the same time, not jeopardize, in this case, the person's future. Fantastic, thank you for sharing, Jerry. Okay, well, we're kind of wrapping up here. We have some time for some questions. If you have any questions for any of the panelists, now would be the time to ask them. Yes, please. Whoever would like to, to answer, I'd be interested in knowing what training you had for your job before you started it, and is there any that you decided quickly thereafter you needed more of? Who wants that one? Go, Jerry. Um, I had been a um, caregiver in my church and had about 100 hours of training uh, in that regard and uh, that, that sort of carried over. My discipline is communication, um, so that was a, a help. Uh, but the Ombuds Office has provided me with uh, training in mediation, conflict coaching, uh, numerous workshops that have been um, uh, uh, focused on skill development, um, and also training from the International Ombuds Association. So kind of it's an ongoing process. Does anybody else want to chime in on that? I, I mean, I'll jump in first Please. again. You, um, you know, I think that what's interesting about these positions, and particularly my own, is it's really a combination of subject matter expertise and other skill sets, right? So um, I come to the profession with you know 29 years of legal practice, um, working in both criminal courts and civil dependency and neglect courts. Um, ran a nonprofit for um, foster youth for many years. So you know that was one set, um, being able to come in and understand how child protection and systems work, right? And the multitude of agencies that that involves, whether it's law enforcement, education, human services, behavioral health. On the second side, though, is really about the notion of um, skill sets in terms of being neutral, objective. How do you facilitate conversations? How do you mediate? Um, and I would say that our team, um, has really uh, tried to take the best advantage we can of outside trainings, whether it's the International Ombudsman Association, United States Ombudsman Association, um, or even local um, work as well, um, you know, whether it deals with conflict resolution, those sorts of things. So I would say that training, at least in our role, falls along two different lines, and everyone in my staff comes with something different. Um, we have former caseworkers in our office. I have a former journalist in my office, um, former behavioral health substance abuse expert in my office, and so we really all come to it with a variety of different skills. Good. I'll just else? comment. My, um, I mean, I think similar to what Stephanie is saying, to me it's, a, it's some conglomeration of, of experiences that enable you to have empathy, to be comfortable in conflict, to love to problem solve, and to work through really messy situations. My education is in art design, law, um, a master's of law in dispute resolution, a certificate in documentary film and storytelling, and then have background in law enforcement, vice and narcotics, um, violence intervention, and then also mediation negotiation in, in more of a academic and, and legal setting. But uh, you know, we are looking for a new colleague, and I think what's really important to us is someone who has that ability to, to
to have empathy, empathy, commit to problem solving, not try to just find an answer immediately, and walk that journey alongside someone in a very difficult situation. Well, that's really, really great answers. <clears throat> what a great breadth of experience from the panel here. That's really fantastic. Um, maybe one more question if we, if we have one. Um, so I, I heard that you sort of the teasing out of, of the issues, Jerry, with, with your scenario that you shared with us. Um, I'm curious to know what techniques you use to get people to settle down and really focus on issues versus sort of the emotional drama that comes with these cases. And then in particular, how do you get people to talk about what's happening today or within the last three to six months versus the last 15 years? Um, well, you, you're doing a lot of, um, of uh, uh, empathic listening. Okay. Uh, it comes in terms of uh, first uh, just keeping myself quiet and maintaining body posture and facial expression, eye contact to hear what they're saying, um, to ask uh, some uh, provocative questions, to get them to open up more about what they're doing. I'm taking notes uh, and, and, and making stars and squiggles and whatnot so that after they've had a chance to talk, I can say, well, it seems to me we've got three issues here. This issue, this issue, this issue. And uh, usually, if I'm able to identify the issues, they get it really quickly. And then I let them pick where we're going to start. What's most important to you? And then we start working on, on that issue. Um, I um, uh, will tr engage in, I don't really have the problem of the last 15 years, and if they want to go down that road, I try to steer them away from that because uh, we can't really litigate the past, and if you want to get, if you're, if you're going to be hung up on, on that, then um, you need to talk to somebody else mm -hmm. because I can't, really, I can't really undo that. Um, I try to get them focused on things that will work for them. Um, talk about how it's going to work out. Well, what if they did this? Well, what if they did that? So um, those those sorts of techniques. Um, uh, I will play. I try to give them alternative scenarios if that seems appropriate. So, for example, a lot of times there's a demonizing of the person that they've they've come in to talk about. And I'll listen to the story and think, gee, I can think of a couple of things that might have happened, but that, you know, that would have, might have led in a different direction. I'll give you an example. The person comes in and they said, um, <clears throat> I think I'm going to lose my job. This is a shorter version. I think I'm going to lose my job because I, uh, why is that? He said, well, because my boss is upset because I went to OIEC. Off, and and oh, so why did you go to these people? He said, well, she said, well, the, uh, I overheard the women in the office talking. And his secretary, who's in her, her uh, 40s, made a comment to the other secretary, who's in her 20s and lactating. Boy, I wish I had breasts like that again. These are two women who are making this comment, and they laugh about it. He said, that was a totally inappropriate comment. And he goes into the boss, and he said, so I'm, I file, I'm going to file this. And the boss said, really? I don't want to hear about it. And he goes ahead, and he files it. And he can't figure out why the boss might be upset. OK. So you know, if a man had made that comment, now we've got a problem. But women. We'll, we'll talk to each other about that. It's a girl, one girl talking to another. He said, have you ever thought about the fact that the, the secretary has been your boss's uh, per, right-hand person for the admin has been there for 15 years? 
and how reliant he might be on her. And that these are two women talking to each other, which guy to guy, honestly, we might not really understand. That may be something that's okay with women. We know it's not okay for a guy to do that. And that um, you've now represented a threat to your, what you're doing is, is asking the boss to actually sever his right arm because now what's he gonna do if this, it, with, with this situation if it becomes an investigation? So your boss is just saying, so I think you need to you know, think about what, what was your boss thinking at that particular moment? Uh, I would never thought about that. I would never taken my boss's position. So, uh, thought about my boss's position. Now, whether that was his boss's thought process or wasn't his boss's thought process, I don't know. But what I was trying to do in that particular case was, was simply to steer the person into a different mental sp space mm -hmm. where he might think there could be other things going on that might explain his boss's response. And now maybe he needs to figure out a way to have a conversation with his boss mm -hmm. in order to protect his job. In that particular instance, I'm trying also to focus on the very narrow issue that that person is worried about, which is my job security. OK. Well, we're coming across the bewitching hour of 5.15, which is our allotted time. I want to thank the audience for being here and coming out to, to, to this uh, panel session and for your thoughtful questions and your participation. I'd like to give great thanks to our esteemed panel who have uh, shared their expertise and time with us today. Um, Liz has been so gracious as to bring gifts for them. And so as you can give them a warm welcome or a warm round of applause for Mary and for Mary and for Linda and for Casey and for Stephanie. Thank you so much.